I'm Kelsey Selleck. I am the Head of Education and Director of Student Theatre at Quincy Community Theatre. That job entails a lot, but mostly that means whenever someone in our community wants to learn more about the theatre, they can come to me. Today, I'm going to talk about how we can use the performing arts to promote accessibility and inclusion in our community. Now, let's address the elephant in the room right away. As a straight white lady, I am not the ideal candidate to be giving a talk about inclusion. But fortunately for us, Quincy has a lot of great resources who can address this topic through training and open dialogue. Just to name a few, Quincy has a Human Rights Commission. We have a chapter of PFLAG. Our Chamber of Commerce has a Diversity and Inclusion Academy. Please utilize groups like theirs and let my talk today supplement their work but not replace it. I find myself in a position because of my job where I'm a gatekeeper. I get to make decisions about what stories are told on our stage and who tells them. Choices I make have an impact on who feels represented on our stage, on who feels welcome in our theater. And that's involved a learning curve for me. There are times where I get it right, there are times where I don't, and I'm very aware that I still have a lot to learn. So today, I want to share some of my experiences so far, some successes, some failures, and ways that I hope we as a community can move forward. Uh, first, a story where I could have done better. Uh, earlier this year, I picked a show for our student theater season called Impressions of Yesterday. And really, I thought I hit the jackpot when I picked this show. It's about two contemporary kids who get the chance to meet artists and inventors from the early 1900s. The, the show had commentary on art and history and science. I was sure school groups were going to love it. Bonus, this script goes out of its way to portray famous women. Nellie Bly, Mary Cassatt, Anna Pavlova. And it shows that women are capable of anything. Such a great message. So I start this process feeling really good about having chosen this play. But then after auditions, one of my students came to me and she said, Miss Kelsey, I didn't think there was going to be a place for me in that show. And it was only then that I realized all of the historical figures portrayed in the show were white. It was only then that I realized my students of color might not have felt welcome in that play. In hindsight, there are a few things I should have done differently. First of all, I should have made it abundantly clear that I was going to have a really open approach to casting. In the theater, we call that colorblind or sometimes color conscious casting, where the actor's race does not have an impact on which roles they play. Uh, and to, to be clear, I did cast the show without regard to race or age or gender for that matter. I had preteen girls playing Nikola Tesla. <laughs> But I never explicitly stated that's what I was going to do, which means some of my students might have assumed otherwise. That's on me. The other thing that I should have done differently is looked at this script from someone else's perspective. I had been so excited about how women were portrayed in the show, you know, because I am one, that I didn't consider who might have felt left out. I did not look far enough beyond my own experience. Ultimately, the show itself was great. All of the kids who were involved did wonderful work. But I learned a hard lesson about representation. I learned I need to communicate better about how I'm going to make a show happen. And I learned, uh, even though I love it, when we can do shows where the race of our actors doesn't matter, on behalf of my students of color, I need to be looking for shows where it does, where they get to celebrate that part of themselves. I don't have an answer for you right now about what that story is going to be on our next season. But I can tell you that I'm looking for it, largely because I know I didn't serve all of my students in choosing that one. Uh, next, a story where I learned something new. At QCT, we have a pretty good relationship with the Quincy Area Autism Support Group. Uh, we did a show about autism a few years ago, and uh, we've been offering classes for students with special needs, and this group has been a fantastic resource to us through those projects. Some of the feedback I was getting from the parents in this group was a desire for a sensory-friendly performance. If you're not familiar, that means for a select performance of a show, some slight modifications are made to accommodate people on the autism spectrum or anybody with a sensitivity to light and sound. So I decided it was worth a try for uh, this summer's production of Elephant and Piggies, We Are in a Play. After some research, 
research, it turns out that the changes we needed to make were relatively small. For one performance only, we changed a few lighting cues, we lowered our sound and microphone levels, we had alternative seating and a chill room for people who needed to move around. Uh, on our website, we had a downloadable pre-show guide so people could review what it's like to see a show at our theater. And I realize this sounds like a lot right now, but in reality, it didn't add much to our workload at all. So on the day of the Sensory Friendly Show, all of these modifications were really well received. But here's the thing that got the biggest response. Uh, before the show, I was giving my little welcome speech. I gave a rundown of the changes that we'd made. But then I said, we're here to tell you a good story. You're just here to be you. And there was this visible, audible sigh of relief throughout the room. For just one hour, no judgments, this group got to sit back and enjoy a play. And it didn't really take extra work for us to facilitate that. So gosh, why don't we do it more often? We're going to is the answer, but that was a great discovery to make. <laughs> uh, here's the other big takeaway from our sensory friendly show. Those modifications we made, you know who else loved those? Parents of young children who were coming to the theater for the first time. They loved getting to use those changes as a resource to introduce their little one to the theater. So, surprise, when you open up options for one group of people, you never know who might also benefit. Great discovery to make. We're going to do it again next season. Yeah. Uh, lastly, a story where, with a lot of help, I learned something new. Uh, in 2017, I directed QCT's production of Tarzan. It is a show that turned out to be a once-in-a-career experience, although I didn't know that at the time. Uh, and for me, it was a really formative experience in terms of learning what is possible when you prioritize somebody else's perspective. The central concept was to include American Sign Language, or ASL, into every aspect of the play. There's a technique called shadow interpreting, where an actor is followed around by a sign language interpreter who shares all of their lines. We used this technique for all of the human characters in Tarzan, but for the ape characters, we used shadow interpreting in reverse. The actors signed their lines, and they had someone follow around to voice them. Tarzan and Jane are the only characters who did both, because throughout the course of the play, they taught each other their respective languages. Yeah, it was exactly as cool as it sounds. Uh, but I had a lot of help. The first person who I had to bring on board was Jane Myrose from Quincy University. At the time, Jane ran the university's sign language interpreter training program. I knew Jane because she had interpreted some of our shows at QCT, and I know she would be a perfect collaborator for this project. Uh, Jane's big request was that we involve the local deaf community. She wanted us to make sure that they knew what we were doing and how we were doing it and how they could be involved if they chose to do so. She even arranged for me to visit a meeting of the Quincy Deaf Club to share with them more about the show. By the way, that group was a fantastic resource. A lot of them bought tickets and came to see the show, plus they gave me great tips on how I was using sign language. I'm lucky for that time with them. So we started the process for Tarzan as planned. We had some QU students come on board as interpreters in the show. Over 100 local actors auditioned to be in the show. And lucky for me, one of those actors was Aaron Williams. Now, Aaron wound up playing Kerchak, who is Tarzan's adoptive ape father in the show. Uh, he had never done a musical before, but Aaron was this really natural, engaging performer. He was a wonderful mentor to our student actors. Aaron is also deaf. In hindsight, I can't believe he agreed to do the show. Uh, he had no reason to trust me. I'm hearing I had never worked with a deaf actor before, but Aaron chose to dive into a new experience and we all benefited from his perspective. Aaron's the kind of guy who would stay late to help people learn new signs. He created sign names for anybody who asked. Here's mine, by the way. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> he was very patient and kind while I asked a lot of questions. Part of the goal of the show was to create the same experience for both our deaf and hearing audience members, but it would have been impossible to accomplish that without having somebody from the deaf community in the room while it was being created. Aaron was instrumental in making that happen, and I will always be grateful when he said yes. Uh, when we opened Tarzan, I knew that we had created something special. On an opening night, we had a group of students in the audience who came all the way from the Illinois School for the Deaf. After the show, I went out into the lobby and I saw the actors greeting these deaf and hard of hearing students, and they were all signing. And after a second, I realized 
I understood them. And I thought, how incredible. Hundreds of people came together to make that show happen, from our theater, from the university, from the deaf community, parents, students, volunteers. By the way, these are all resources our community already had. It was just a matter of getting us all in the same room. We all took on a challenge we'd never tried before, and something great happened. And yeah, it was a lot of work. It was the biggest and the most exhausting thing that I've ever done, but I would do it all again in a heartbeat for another chance to see those kids signing together in the lobby. As I describe it, I know that I'm making us sound like little do-gooder theater people, <laughs> but the, the truth is I had just as much to gain from this as anybody uh, because I suddenly had to think about how deaf audience members were perceiving the show. That made me think on a more visual level which has improved my skills as a director. Uh, after working with sign language interpreters, that made me be more precise in my instruction, which has made me a better teacher. Plus, I'm pretty sure the fact that we sold every ticket to every performance of Tarzan put me in good standing with my board of directors. <laughs> so, this nice little project about accessibility and inclusion wound up having a hugely positive impact on my professional life. I bring that part up because while we were making Tarzan, there were plenty of people who told me I was wasting my time. People who thought I was too caught up in a gimmick or too worried about being politically correct uh, and that I wasn't going to gain anything. But those people were wrong. When we create access, everybody wins. I wish I had come to that conclusion sooner. I wish I was implementing it more in what I'm doing now at QCT, and I know I still need reminders of it sometimes. But when we create access, everybody wins. So here's what I think we as a community can do to keep on winning. First of all, if a local organization takes on a project to promote inclusion, go. Buy a ticket. Support it. Show that organization that they're making a worthwhile choice. Second, if you get a chance to work with a new faction of your community, with somebody who's different from you, you're going to have to do a little homework. At minimum, you're going to have to pronounce names correctly, use preferred gender pronouns, and whatever other vocabulary that group wants, they get to pick. If that sounds like a lot, you'll get used to it, but that's an important step towards being respectful towards other people. And lastly, know when you need to ask for help. I've already listed a few great resources here in Quincy, but if a town of 40,000 people has all of those groups, I'm confident you can find something like it in a community of any size. Uh, when you're ready to turn your good intentions into actions, go see groups like them. As for me, I'm going to keep looking for ways to keep our stage accessible and inclusive. Some of that is going to involve expanding upon the projects I've discussed today. I also know I must start to produce more work that was written by people of color, by women, by members of the LGBTQ community. New stories need to be told. I know I have to figure out a way to make space for other directors, people who don't look like me or live like me and have different ideas to share with my students. These things might be long-term goals, but I can't lose sight of them. And I'm saying them out loud today as a commitment to making them happen. Mostly, I know I've just got to keep listening and learning about the community around me. I get it right sometimes, but I've had failures far beyond the one I've described today. I can do better. We all can do better. And I think if we work together and keep listening to each other, we can find ways to move forward. Thank you.